Uh, that shark freaked the shit out of you, didn't it? Yeah, it did. It comes from watching Jaws when I was a little kid, and... Well, I, I'm not really afraid of sharks anymore, but... Suddenly running into something like that brings back old memories. Did you know about the new Medal of Honor coming out? What do you think about Medal of Honor set in modern-day Afghanistan? I think... Uh, I think that... The franchise kind of needed a reboot in that way, and a new setting is certainly a way to accomplish it. Uh, I guess it's kind of... You could say it's pop... It's, uh... Building off the success of modern warfare, but... I, I don't see anything really wrong with that. And, uh... I, I hope that the story stuff that they intend on doing with it is actually coherent and uh, serves to bolster, a, actually create a character that's really memorable or a set of characters that's really memorable, unlike in the fir in other Medal of Honor games where, yeah, Jimmy Patterson's a character, but he doesn't say anything. He doesn't, he doesn't really have a personality, per se. So maybe they'll build off that and actually make a game where that has more personality than uh, its competitor, but maybe about just about a solid gameplay. That's really my thoughts on that. This video is over because I have no time. So, uh, yes, that's all the questions, and next will be a dramatic reading of The Scarlet Abyss. Alright, so after about 30 seconds of searching on the internet, I have found a transcript of The Scarlet Abyss. I'm gonna read it all to you. Why don't you join me in exploring the depths of bad literature? Let's get started. The Scarlet Abyss by James Hurst. Summer was dead, but autumn had not yet been born when the abyss came to the bleeding tree. It's strange that all this is so clear to me, now that time has had its way. But sometimes, like right now, I sit in the cool green parlor and I remember Doodle. Doodle was about the craziest brother a boy ever had. Doodle was born when I was seven and was, from the start, a disappointment. He seemed all head, with a tiny body that was red and shriveled like an old man's. Everybody thought he was going to die. Daddy had the carpenter build a little coffin, and when he was three years old, Mom and Daddy named him William Armstrong. Such a name sounds good only on a tombstone. When he crawled on the rug, he crawled backward, as if he were in reverse and couldn't change gears. This made him look like a doodle bug, so I began calling him Doodle. Renaming my brother was probably the kindest thing I ever did for him, because nobody expects much from somebody called Doodle. Daddy built him a cart, and I had to pull him around. If I so much as picked up my hat, he'd start crying to go with me, and Mama would call from wherever she was, Take Doodle with you! So I dragged him across the cotton field to share the beauty of Old Woman Swamp. I lifted him out and sat down on the soft grass. He began to cry. What's the matter? It's so pretty, brother. So pretty. After that, Doodle and I went down to Old Woman's Swamp. There is inside me, and with sadness I have seen it in others, a knot of cruelty borne by a stream of love. And at times I was mean to Doodle. One time I shoved him his, I showed him his casket, telling him how we all believed he would die. Then I made him touch the casket, and he screamed. And even when we were outside in the bright sunshine, he clung to me, crying, Don't leave me, brother! Don't leave me! Doodle was five years old when I turned thirteen. I was embarrassed by having a brother of that age who couldn't walk, so I set out to teach him. We were down in an old woman's swamp. I'm going to teach you to walk, Doodle, I said. Why? So I don't have to haul you around all the time. I can't walk, brother. So says who? Mama, the doctor, everybody. Oh, you can walk. I took him by the arms and stood him up. He collapsed on the grass like a half-empty flour sack. It was as if his little legs had no bones. Don't hurt me, brother. Shut up. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to teach you to walk. I heaved him up again, and he collapsed. I just can't do it. Oh, yes, you can, Doodle. All you got to do is try. Now come on. And I hold him up once more. It seems so hopeless that it's a miracle I didn't give up. But all of us must have something to be proud of, and Doodle had become my something. Finally, one day, he stood alone for a few seconds. When he fell, I grabbed him in my arms and hugged him, our laughter ringing through the swamp like a bell. Now we knew it could be done. We decided not to tell anyone until he was actually walking. At breakfast on our chosen day, I brought Doodle to the door in the cart. I helped Doodle up, and when he was standing alone, I let him look. There wasn't a sound as Doodle walked slowly across the room and sat down at the table. 
Then Mama began to cry and ran over to him, hugging him and kissing him. Daddy hugged him, too. Doodle told them it was I who had taught him to walk, so they wanted to hug me, and I began to cry. What are you crying for? asked Daddy, but I couldn't answer. They didn't know that I just did it for myself, that Doodle only walked because I was ashamed of having a crippled brother. Within a few months, Doodle had learned to walk well. Since I had succeeded in teaching Doodle to walk, I began to believe in my own infallibility. I decided to teach him to run, to row, to swim, to climb trees, to, to fight. Now he, too, believed in me, so we set a deadline when Doodle would start school. But Doodle couldn't keep up with the plan. Once, he collapsed on the ground and began to cry. Oh, come on, Doodle, you can do it. Do you want to be different from everybody else when you start school? Does it make any difference? It certainly does. Now come on. And so we came to those days when summer was dead, but autumn had not yet been born. It was Saturday noon, just a few days before the start of school. Daddy, Mama, Doodle, and I were seated at the dining room table having lunch. Suddenly, from out in the yard came a strange croaking noise. Doodle stopped eating. What's that? He slipped out into the yard and looked up at the bleeding tree. It's a big red bird! Mama and Daddy came out. On the topmost branch perched a bird the size of a chicken with scarlet feathers and long legs. At that moment, the bird began to flutter. It tumbled down through the bleeding tree and landed at our feet with a thud. Its graceful neck jerked twice and then straightened out, and the bird was still. It lay on the earth like a broken vase of red flowers, and even death could not mar its beauty. What is it? Doodle asked. It's a scarlet abyss, Daddy said. Sadly, we all looked at the bird. How many miles had it traveled to die like this? In our yard, beneath the bleeding tree. Doodle knelt beside the abyss. I'm going to bury him. As soon as I had finished eating, Doodle and I hurried off to Horsehead Landing. It was time for a swimming lesson, but Doodle said he was too tired. When we reached Horsehead Landing, lightning was flashing across half the sky, and thunder was drowning out the sound of the sea. Doodle was both tired and frightened. He slipped on the mud and fell. I helped him up, and he smiled at me ashamedly. He had failed, and we both knew it. He would never be like the other boys at school. We started home, trying to beat the storm. The lightning was near now. The faster I walked, the faster he walked, so I began to run. The rain came, roaring through the pines, and then, like a bursting Roman candle, a gum tree ahead of us sh was shattered by a lightning bolt. When the deafening thunder had died, I heard Doodle cry out, Brother, brother, don't leave me, don't leave me! The knowledge that our plans had come to nothing was bitter, and that streak of cruelty within me awakened. I ran as fast as I could, leaving him far behind with a wall of rain dividing us. Soon I could hear his voice no more. I stopped and waited for Doodle. The sound of rain was everywhere, but the wind had died and fell straight down like ropes hanging from the sky. I peered to the downpour, but no one came. Finally, I went back and found him huddled beneath a red nightshade bush beside the road. He was sitting on the ground, his face buried in his arms, which were resting on drawn-up knees. Let's go, Doodle. He didn't answer, so I gently lifted his head. He toppled backward onto the earth. He had been bleeding from the mouth, and his neck and the front of his shirt were stained a brilliant red. Doodle! Doodle! There was no answer but the ropey rain. I began to weep, and the tear-blurred vision in red before me looked very familiar. Doodle! I screamed above the pounding storm and threw my body to the earth above his. For a long time, it seemed forever. I lay there crying, sheltering my fallen scarlet abyss. End. Okay, it wasn't as bad as I remember it. Can you, can you please tell me what the story... What? This story is... What, what's the purpose? What, what's, what? I, I'm not sure if it's just something I'm not getting, or does this just, is this just bad? Or is it something I'm not getting? Is there some kind of inner meaning that makes all this story seem worthwhile and seem act like it actually has a purpose? Or is it just, what? What, what, what am I supposed to learn from reading this? What does it mean? Okay, so he abandons his brother and his brother dies? And it's like a bird that dies, that was red, and walking, and running, that, 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 that. 
It's like there are three different stories here. Like the author wanted to write a story about a kid who who is par not paralyzed, but he who has physical disabilities and then overcomes them. And he wants to write a story that's really brooding and and sad about a. Uh, Cripple kids dying, and then he wants to write a story about a, a brilliant tropical bird. And he decides, let's throw them all together. Let's see if we can do a quick search on James Hurst, the author, to see what else he has written. James Hurst, Wikipedia. He's apparently still alive. James Hurst, born 1 January 1922, is a retired American banker known as the author of short stories. He's most famous for writing The Scarlet Abyss, first published in Athletic Monthly, is blah blah blah, and his since widely anthologized. Apparently that's the only thing of worth he has ever written. The Scarlet Abyss is a short story written by novelist James Hurst. It was first published in the Atlantic Monthly on July 1960 and has been appeared in many high school literature textbooks since the late 60s. <sighs> Let's see. The, the, the plot description on Wikipedia is basically what I just read. And... The story... What's the fucking point? I don't know. If you wonder what the Scarlet Abyss looks like, it looks kind of like a kiwi, but it's red. At least I think it looks like a kiwi. Let's see. Kiwi the bird, of course. Kiwi. Yeah, it looks kind of like a kiwi, but it's red. Yeah. So, that's what a Scarlet Abyss is. Why is the Scarlet Abyss here? Is there some kind of symbolism I don't get? I, I just don't know. To me, this just sounds terrible. I, I hate having to read that. That was just bad. But anyway, that's the end to the Q&A session. And my camera apparently has five minutes worth of battery left. Which is good, because I've got about four minutes of recording time. So, worked out okay, I guess. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, this is probably the longest recording session I ever did for anything, let alone a Q&A. Um, hopefully my ugly mug hasn't scared away too many of you. But, uh, hopefully I should be l uploading videos a lot more often, meaning not once every two weeks, maybe once every two days, maybe? If, at that rate, I'll probably finish the Half-Life Let's Play with next week. Should, if things go right. Hey, I'll give you an idea of what my weekly schedule is if I have time, yeah. Monday is a good day for me to record or upload, and probably both, so I... Tomorrow I could probably record an upload. I'm not going to do it Sunday because I'll be busy uploading all this. Tuesday is a good day for me to do nothing because I have no time to, on Tuesday to do anything. Wednesday is a good day for me to either record or upload but not both. Thursday is a good day for me to basically do the same as as a Wednesday. Good day to record or upload but not both. So I should record something on Wednesday and upload it on Thursday. Friday is a good day to record but not upload. And Saturday is a good day for anything. Sunday is a good day for anything. That's kind of what my week. So I should theoretically be able to at least upload three sets a week. And that's kind of what I'm going to try and do from now on. Now that I've kind of settled my schedule. Uh, Fridays may or may not be changeable because of theater practicum. And that has wonky hours. And uh, Sundays can sometimes be busy because I have tests for biology on Sundays. They're over the internet. I don't, ha I don't take an online biology course, but some of the tests, the quizzes are online. Uh, what else can I ramble on about? Um, tell me what you think about camera LP on this camera. Uh, see what if you do camera LPs and can you recommend something to see maybe if this works. I want it to work. I would love it if it worked and if it looked decent. But uh, at the current rate, I just don't like it. Maybe you have differing opinions. Please tell me what you think. Um, also, tell me what you think about Let's Players actually showing what they look like. Does that does that ruin any of the mystique of Let's Play, if there is any mystique? Or does it help you identify with the commentators more? And tell me about Q&A videos in general. You can even give me more questions if you want. That would be cool. Prepare for Q&A number, what, number seven? Is this the sixth video in the Q&A series or the seventh? I don't know. When I finish editing them, I'll know. It's going to be a mess. I hope I can get them up on Sunday, because, man, editing this shit, it's going to be painful. I have one minute of recording time left. Thank you for watching. I'll see you later. Yeah. Good night. I'm going to go fall asleep. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. Why am I still awake? Goodbye.